Well, amen, and again, good morning, and welcome to King's Cross. My name is Clint, lead pastor, one of the elders. It is a joy to be with you and to be able to preach this morning. Uh, it's been a crazy last kind of eight weeks for us, uh, which included uh, a month ago, my wife getting COVID, and then none of, nobody else in the house getting it, and then weeks ago, me getting it and being in quarantine yet again. But now I'm out of isolation. I joked with my bride early this week when my last day of isolation that the next day I was going to be like a caged animal set free. So here we go, caged animal ready to preach. So buckle up. <clears throat> now I appreciate your prayers and texts and encouragement uh, in that time. And, uh, and it is a joy and privilege to be with you. Also want to say to the visitors, glad that you're here and welcome you and let you know that Lord willing, we're waiting here back from the city on some final uh, permitting conversations, but hopefully that'll happen even Monday. And then some renovations on the building are going to start. Uh, so kind of first over in the fellowship hall and then up in the kids space. So all that'll be renovated. Uh, and then we will move at some point the service over to the new fellowship hall area so that the sanctuary will finish being renovated as well and updated. So just know that'll be going on. Uh, and if you're a visitor with us and your, your child is maybe downstairs and you're curious as to why the kids space is down there, well, it's just temporary. We're fixing up a new kids space and look forward to that. So let's pray uh, and we'll jump in and begin this morning. Father, I thank you for your word. I thank you for this church. It is a joy and privilege to open up your word, to speak as an instrument, and even mindful of the text this morning, would you please protect these people from me saying anything wrong about you and protect me from saying anything wrong about you. We want to know you. We want to know you as you are and as you've revealed yourself. So Holy Spirit, would you give grace even right now through uh, my preaching. May it be faithful to your word. And would you give grace by your spirit to, so that hearts of everyone gathered and listening would hear you, know you, love you, follow you, trust you, and see that you are indeed good. In Jesus' name, his good name we pray. Amen. Have you ever felt the pain of being misrepresented by one person to another? To that second person, such that you want to go to the second person and say, no, 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 what you heard about me isn't true, or at least it's not the whole story. So you heard something, and, there's, and some of it may be true, some of it might not be true, but, but you don't get the whole story, and I feel misrepresented now, and I want to defend and let you know the truth about who I am or about what has happened. Or maybe you've been on the other side of that experience. Maybe someone has described another person to you, painted a particular picture of that person, how they act, their demeanor, their character, their relations. And then you meet that person and you kind of do the mental sideways head. This is not what I expected. You're not quite what that person described to me. So the way they described you is not now how I interact with or am experiencing you. Throughout the page of Scripture, we see that this often happens with God himself. That people misrepresent God. They speak about him in such a way that then when you come and interact with him in his word, your head turns sideways like, wait a minute, this is not quite what I expected. And the difference between God and us in this interaction is he's perfect. So you need to understand your greatest, most lofty thoughts about God are puny compared to the truth about God. You can't even get your head around how beautiful and glorious and majestic and righteous and true and lovely he is. You can't even get there. So your greatest thoughts fail in accuracy about the glories of God. And that means your lowest or your wrongest thoughts about God are infinitely evil. You think wrongly about God. You think wrongly about the one who is most glorious. So he has a different kind of experience than we do because we know at the end of the day we are sinful. And there are things, if people knew more about us, they would, they would think less of us. If they knew our private thoughts and the things we've done in secret that no one else knows, they would surely think less of us, not higher. But if we accurately knew more about God, we would think even higher about him. So throughout the pages of Scripture, when we see God misrepresented, we see a particular grievous sin in reality, when those misrepresenting him are supposed to be his ambassadors, those who are supposed to represent him. So we see even in the Old Testament, God's people, Israel, misrepresent him. They're supposed to be a holy people set apart, and instead they go into pagan nations, and instead of showing what it looks like to be set apart as holy people to God, instead they bow down to false idols. We see other, like, just uh, misrepresentations by the kings, by the prophets, by the priests who fail in their unique calling, and they misrepresent God. 
In the New Testament, we see churches sometimes fail to be a holy people set apart in representing God as ambassadors of Christ in His kingdom. We see false teachers who masquerade themselves, as Paul says, as angels of the light, when in fact they're actually laboring on behalf of Satan and the, the enemy, the one of darkness. It's always a painful thing when, when, as a pastor, I sit down and talk to somebody, and I realize God has been misrepresented to them. That perhaps it was they, they, they were misunderstood God because they've been participating and listening and believing in a false religion, a false God. Other times, maybe it was a well-meaning parent or mentor or friend giving them advice and saying, surely this is what God wants, but they misrepresented God. And so now they're confused about life and what's going on because what their people told them about God is not lining up with their experience of life. But worst of all is when I have a conversation with someone and I realize they've sat under false preaching and teaching. That someone has stood behind a pulpit and stood behind the Word of God and taught it and taught it unfaithfully such that now they don't even know the true God of Scripture. The Lord Jesus reserved His harshest words and actions for religious leaders who misrepresented him. In his day, the first century Jewish cultures, the Jewish religious leaders, those, the Pharisees and scribes. And in Matthew chapter 23, we'll get there at some point in weeks, months, maybe years, who knows, eventually. But Matthew 23, he speaks of the scribes and Pharisees and says they tie up heavy burdens hard to bear and lay them on people's shoulders, but they themselves are not willing to move them with a finger. And he contrasts that kind of false leadership and misrepresentation of God himself, Jesus, son, the Son of God, with himself, as we saw in our study two weeks ago at the end of Matthew chapter 11. Come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon me, learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart. You'll find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. So we come to Christ, we bring our sin our sinful, awful things, and even the good works that we thought were good, but we actually find out we're motivated by sin. We bring him our good works or bring him our bad works or bring him our sin, and we come to him weary and heavy laden, sometimes heavy laden because of our sin, sometimes heavy laden because of false teachers misrepresenting. We bring it all to him, and he says, come to me, and I'll give you rest. Rest for your souls. But then he says, take my yoke upon you. Learn from me. I'm gentle and lowly in heart. You can take my easy burden and my, my easy yoke. So the question this morning, and as we continue in our study, is what does it look like to walk with Christ with this easy yoke and this light burden? How are the Pharisees misrepresenting him by offering a heavy burden? And what does it look like to truly walk with God and carry this burden that he offers that is light and easy? What did this contrast look like in real time? How do you know if you're getting the true teaching of Christ or false teaching misrepresenting God? Even today. What does it look like when a person wrongly interprets the law and more importantly misrepresents what the law says about God such that it conflicts with the gospel of God's grace in Christ, leading people to have wrong thoughts about God? So understand what's at stake here. If you get taught wrongly about God and you believe wrongly about God, you believe wrongly about God. You don't understand how to have right relationship with him if you believe wrong things about him. So the question is, okay, what are, what are true things about him? What, what is this gospel? What does it look like to live a life on, in, in following this Christ, this one who says, come to me and I will give you rest? This contrast is put on clear display today in our text and how the Pharisees wrongly interpret what the law says about the Sabbath and then this interaction with Christ. So you want a main point for this morning. And this is a mind-boggling point, and I hope it all comes together. We'll see if it does. See if COVID fog and brain is still working or if anything's clear. Lord willing, you've got the scriptures. Read it. That's all you need. But Jesus is Lord of the Sabbath, and yet the divine servant who brings justice, hope, and victory to the weak and weary. Jesus is the Lord of the Sabbath, yet the divine servant who brings justice, hope, and victory to the weak and weary. Weary. And so what I want to do is give you three truths about God. I want you to really know rightly about him that it might lead to worship in your heart. Three truths about God. Jesus is Lord. Jesus is good and he does good. Jesus is our hope. So firstly, Jesus is Lord. Look again, chapter 12, verse 1. The Pharisees are going to start by accusing Jesus' disciples. At that time, Jesus went throughout the grain fields on the Sabbath. 
His disciples were hungry and they began to pluck heads of grain and to eat. But when the Pharisees saw it, they said to him, Look, your disciples are doing what is not lawful to do on the Sabbath. Now let's explain a couple of things about the law and what's going on culturally. So first, God has always demonstrated throughout the pages of Scripture that he and his people have concern for the poor. Always. This is consistent with who God is. It's always consistent with the faithful people of God. So when the disciples are picking grain and eating it, understand what the Pharisees are upset about is not that they're taking grain from a field that doesn't belong to them. So in the scriptures, the law made provisions for the poor, for the foreigner, for the sojourner, for the widow, for the orphan, for the outsider, the refugee, if you will. That they would say, when you reap uh, the field, don't reap the edges. That's left over for the poor. That's left over for those in great need. So you are allowed, if you were a foreigner, a traveler, a widow, an orphan, if you're a person who is poor, to, to gain food from the edges of the field. So that, that's not what the disciples are doing wrong here. God has always had this concern for the poor. We, we read it very clearly, Leviticus 23, 22. When you reap the harvest of your land, you shall not reap the field right up to its edge, nor shall you gather gleanings after your harvest. You shall leave them for the poor and for the sojourner. I am the Lord your God. So the, the Pharisees are not upset that the disciples are eating from someone else's field. So let's just make sure you understand that's not the issue. That's not what's going on. They could do that every day of the week. What they're upset about is what day they're doing that on. So he says, look, your disciples are doing what is not lawful to do on the Sabbath. Now the Sabbath, what, what is the Sabbath? The Sabbath was instituted by Yahweh as a day of rest. So God creates the earth in six days and on the seventh day he rests and then in the covenant at Sinai with his people, he sets apart and lets them know, no, this Sabbath day rest is a holy day of rest. It's set apart for our people as a gift from God that his people might rest. And so this is what we read in the fourth commandment, Exodus chapter 20, verse 8. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. On it you shall not do any work, or your son, or your daughter, or your male servant, your female servant, your livestock, the sojourner who is within your gates. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea and all that is in them, and rested on the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. Therefore for the Jewish people in this moment, work on the Sabbath day is illegal. And the rabbis of the day taught that this included rubbing grain to remove the husks. So if you grab some grain and you rubbed it together to get the husk off so that it was eatable or edible, they would say eatable, e edible, anyway, brain fog, let's keep it going. If you did that, they would say, that's work. You can't do work on the Sabbath. Therefore, you can't do that. So when the Pharisees look and see the disciples picking the grain, rubbing the husk, they're saying, time out. That's work. You're not allowed to do that on the Sabbath. That's what they're complaining about. This is the forbidden work that they see. But then notice what our Lord does. <clears throat> like, if you're going to pick on Jesus and pick a fight with him particularly, you better come correct when it comes to the Bible <laughs> and about the law. And so what he's going to do is he's going to expose their selective reading of Scripture. So in this moment, they're wanting to say, see, guilty. Jesus is like, hold up, hold up, time, 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 time. Verse 3, he said to them, have you not read what David did when he was hungry and those who were with him? How he entered the house of God and ate the bread of the presence, which was not lawful for him to eat, nor for those who were with him, but only for the priests? Or have you not read in the law how on the Sabbath the priests in the temple profane the Sabbath and are guiltless? Now, real quick, before we move into explaining what all he's asking and pointing at, notice he says, have you not read? When Jesus was regularly interacting with the crowds, what would he say to the crowds? You have heard that it was said, but I say unto you. To the Pharisees and scribes, he's like, hold up, y'all got the Bible. <laughs> like, y'all have the scriptures. You don't have an excuse for you heard false teachers. Have you not read? You boast in the fact you have the scriptures. You boast in the fact you're experts in the law. Have you not read? Are you going to come at me with law? Do you not understand from the very scriptures that you've read? They've got the law, they have the prophets, they have the wisdom literature, they have the word of God. They're supposed to be teachers of God's word, teaching those who can only hear, not read, but they are those who can read, teach, and hear. And therefore, Jesus exposes their misunderstanding of who God is and of what God is like by pointing out two obvious exceptions they've read about that ought to make it clear who Jesus is. He's like, no, if you're reading your Bible carefully and clearly, you would understand there are exceptions, and these exceptions should be saying something to you about me that you're ignoring. Exception number one, David ate the bread of the presence. What is this? So every Sabbath, there was an offering of 12 loaves of bread representing the 12 tribes of Israel. It was placed in the tabernacle as an act of worship to Yahweh. 
This bread was to be eaten only by the priests, those set apart as the priests of God to, to oversee the worship of God's people. However, when King David was fleeing from Saul for his life, there was a moment where he and his men were hungry. They end up eating the bread of the presence. And this is in the scriptures. It's recorded in the scriptures. Do not condemn this as wrong. That there is this moment where the scripture is saying this is not breaking the law. This is not condemned as wrong. Why? Because this is the great King David and he's fleeing for his life and, the, and he and his boys are hungry. And so there's a moment where the scriptures don't say now he broke the law. Christ is, is messing with them in this conversation. But he's saying this exception happened and you didn't think anything about it. Why? Because it was the great King David. Okay, interesting. Second illustration. What about the priests? The priests have to do the sacrifices, oversee the worship in the temple, get the temple ready, get the sacrifices ready, prepare all of this for the worship of God. They're, they're profaning the Sabbath by doing all of this work. You haven't thought any, you haven't said anything about that. So you understand that the Sabbath is a gift from God given to the people of God for rest, but there are situations where God is demonstrating in order to give this gift, there are exceptions to this. And so he just highlights these. So you've got your Bible. And then notice what happens. He's exposing that their false accusation is a result of the fact that they don't recognize him as Lord. So that's what's happening. He's like, no, you didn't have a problem with David doing it because you thought highly of King David. You didn't have a problem with the priest doing it because you understand how important the temple is for the worship of the people of God. Right now, you've got a problem with me doing it because you don't recognize who I am. This is the problem. This is really not about the law. This is about the identity of Jesus Christ. This is what's happening. And he responds and makes it real clear. Verse 6, I tell you something greater than the temple is here. Which this is a, this is a statement that would be, you know, get the, the mind-blowing emoji all over the place for all the Pharisees and scribes. Tell me, what did you just say? Yes, the great King David could do that because he was the great King David. Yes, the priest can do that because the temple is where we meet with the very presence of God in, as the people of God. You're saying something greater than the temple is here. The temple's even greater than David. And you're saying something. What's greater than the temple? Who's greater than King David? And if you had known what this means, I desire mercy and not sacrifice, you would have not condemned the guiltless for the Son of Man is Lord of the Sabbath. So notice a few things about what Jesus does right here. <clears throat> Number one, he's clearly making the statement by implication that he's greater than the great King David. So he's letting them know, you had no beef with this because of how great you recognize him to be, I'm greater. He's also demonstrating. So if David and his boys can go eat the bread of the presence, me and mine can go to the grain fields. <laughs> because you don't recognize who I am in this new covenant community, therefore who they are in connection to me. He also shows he's greater than the temple, where God's presence dwells. Again, this is a massive statement. The temple is where God met with his people. It's where his unique Shekinah glory resided. It's where his presence was. But Jesus is like, no, something greater than the temple of God where his presence meets with y'all. The presence of God is here, present right now. You're looking at him. <laughs> so that's, that's what Christ is saying. He's saying, no, no, I'm greater than King David. I am greater even than the temple. Jesus is God present in the world. <laughs> Not just God's presence in the world. He is him present in the world. He's demonstrating that he is divine. So in this statement, he's letting you know, I'm Lord. And that's where he eventually uh, makes crystal clear. But he's also showing you he's greater than the Sabbath. He's like, the Sabbath is a great, so he doesn't diminish the Sabbath. He doesn't abrogate it. He doesn't do away with it in this moment. We can have conversations about that. Some of you want to know, and oh, is the sermon is clean. Let's say what we're allowed to do on Sunday or not. No, that you missed the whole point if that's what you ask. That's what they're doing. Jesus said, no, no, no. Something greater than the Sabbath is here. The Sabbath was God giving you a gift of rest for a day. I'm here giving you a gift of rest for eternity. <laughs> Not just a day of rest because God is good. I'm the very means by which you get to rest every day for all eternity in the presence of a holy and righteous God, though you're sinful. Come to me, all who are weary and heavy laden. I will give you rest. Rest for your souls. So he said something greater than David here, something greater than the temples here, something greater than the Sabbath is here. And he says, if you really knew God and you didn't misunderstand him and misinterpret and misrepresent him to others, then you would understand Hosea 6.6, 6, which is what he quotes. The compassionate mercy is greater than scrupulous sacrifice. That the law of God is meant to motivate and empower the people of God to show compassion and mercy and kindness, just like God does. 
Think about scribes and Pharisees. Like they're painting a picture of God like he's this trigger-happy sniper ready to take you out as soon as you mess up a little bit. When God is like, think about the covenant love of God for Israel. (laughs) Slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. Think of how many times they went astray and how many times he brought them back and received them because he's compassionate and kind and loving. So he's like, no mercy is greater than sacrifice. I'm not impressed with your law keeping. Like, you actually are proud of something that condemns you to hell. (laughs) You're proud of your law-keeping, thinking that impresses me. Your law-keeping right now is being demonstrated as actually law-breaking. Even your good deeds are like uh, righteous, filthy rags. This is put on display. It's like, no, if you would understand and know the heart of God, you would understand and know mercy is greater than sacrifice. And all of this ultimately points to this one point. Jesus is Lord of the Sabbath. And by that, he's saying, I'm Lord of all. The only way you can be greater than David, greater than the temple, greater than the Sabbath, and say mercy is greater than sacrifice is if you're the God of the universe. And so he says, Jesus is Lord of the Sabbath. Which then says his interpretation of the law is the right interpretation of the law. His opinion of the law is what matters. And your relationship to him, therefore, then is what matters. And what is his reputation? What is his interpretation of the law? What is his demonstration of himself? He's gentle and lowly to the repentant. Those who understand and know I'm guilty of breaking the law and look to him for forgiveness and submit to him as Lord and King, he says, come to me. I give you rest. Walking with me is like a light burden. It's a burden that is no burden. It's like a yoke that is no yoke, as as, uh, Ortland says in his book, Gentle and Lowly. He says, come to me. And so what does this mean for you today, this morning? Well, to say Jesus is Lord, to call yourself a Christian, his word must be the final authority in your life. Sometimes when we're having Bible studies, people say, well, what does that verse mean to you? <clears throat> okay, don't be mean, all right? That would be a violation of everything we're talking about right now. Who cares what it means to you? What does it mean to Christ? That's what matters. This is the problem with a people who understand themselves to be the God of their own universe. They say, what does this verse mean to me? Now, how do I respond and apply to this verse? Amen. And if that's what people mean, amen. Let's be kind and gracious. And, oh, what you mean is how should you respond to that verse in light of it being true? But our job as Christians, our job as people is not to say, what do I think God is? Who do I think God is? Who has God said he is? Who has he revealed himself to be? And do I bow to him as Lord or do I reject him? One or the other. But he's Lord, and his interpretation of the law is the right interpretation of the law. It doesn't matter what anybody else's thoughts about it are. If they agree with Christ, they're right. Disagree, they're wrong. Jesus makes these kinds of statements. That's what it means to be Lord. It's not like I'm one of the options. No, Jesus is Lord of the Sabbath. He's in charge. He's the King. He's the Messiah. But again, please see this. And the reality of this, the Sabbath is, is meant to be a blessing, not a burden. Because God in Christ is gentle and lowly, and he's the Lord of the Sabbath. So to read any passage in Scripture, to to bring this all together, to read the Bible correctly, no matter if it's a passage about David, about the temple, about the Sabbath, about God's mercy or God's judgment, ultimately the conclusion of every single passage, if you back out far enough and see the panoramic view of the whole Scripture, is Jesus is Lord. This is how you ought to read the Bible. Jesus is Lord. To authentically know God and not some misrepresentation of him. You must bow to Jesus as Lord. Now, this is really bad news if he is indeed a trigger-happy sniper ready to get you if you mess up. That's really bad news. But if he really is gentle and lowly, if he really is full of grace and mercy and compassion, this is glorious news, which moves me to the second point. Jesus is good, and he does good. So first, Jesus is Lord. You must land there of the Sabbath and indeed of all things. But secondly, Jesus is good and he does good. So first, the Pharisees try to get Jesus' disciples. Now immediately they're trying to set a trap for Jesus himself. Look at verse 9. Jesus went on from there and entered their synagogue, the place of worship. Again, the intimate communing place with God and, and his people. And a man was there with a withered hand, and they asked him, Is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath? So that they might accuse him. So let's talk a little bit about healings on the Sabbath. And again, so they're, they're, they're looking for any error of doing work on the Sabbath that's not permitted. Typically, most rabbis would teach that on the Sabbath, healings were permitted if it was a life and death situation. 
So if someone was going to die, some kind of medical uh, procedure or even a supernatural praying for healing, that was, that was okay if the person might die. But this is not that. This man's hand is withered. It's paralyzed. He can't use it. The skin is messed up. It's, it's, it's a painful, nasty, awful, horrible situation, but he's not dying. So typically, the way the law would have been interpreted and applied in this day is that man needs to wait till a different day, not this day. He just needs to suffer and wait because that would involve work on the Sabbath. So we must not do that on this day. No medical attention, no healing until the next day. One commentator even notes how extreme this law was, saying it was illegal to tie a bandage, set a broken bone, or administer medicine. Some rabbis even banned prayer for the sick on the Sabbath. A couple weeks ago, my 12-year-old daughter uh, was playing outside after service. <clears throat> the kids were having a good time right after her service. And I don't know if you're new to King's Cross, you need to understand people hang around for like an hour afterwards. Uh, it's incredible. It's wonderful. And so the kids were out there playing, and, uh, and she ran into kind of the, the, the wall and hurt her wrist a little bit. We thought, you know, thought, thought she sprained her wrist. So that was on a Sunday. Within, I think it was Tuesday the next week at school, she's playing soccer, and, uh, and somebody trips her playing soccer. She falls, tries to catch herself, and hurts it again. Well, about a week later after that, we're sitting outside, and she's still, like, favoring her arm pretty bad. And I was like, Rage, baby, I, like, I, a sprain, is this, is this is not a sprain situation. Like, she shouldn't still be hurting the way she's hurting. I think we need to get an x-rayed. Eden overhears us and, like, immediately gets emotional and is like, no. And the reason she's saying no, because then she thinks, I won't be able to play soccer or be able to play with my friends. It's like, baby, if your arm's broken, like, I, I, amen, you're going to have to do something about it. Like, you know, I'm sorry you're upset about not getting to play with your friends, but if it's, if it's broken, we need to do something with it. And so, I, you know, several days later, we, we, we get it scheduled. She goes, and, uh, and then I get a, a, a picture message from a wife via text with Eden smiling with a cast on because she has a broken arm. Now, there's a couple of things I learned from this scenario. One, my daughter is tough as nails. She had a broken arm for a couple of weeks, and we thought it was just sprained. But to be clear, as a father with my daughter, whom I love, compassion was like, look, baby, I hear you saying it's okay, but I'm not sure that it's okay, and I care about you, so I want to make sure it's okay, so we're going to go do everything we can to make sure and get this healed up, get you a cast on. As soon as we were convinced something's wrong, we're going to do something about it. Why? Because I love my daughter, because I have compassion. Now, it, imagine if her arm would have been broken and like pointing the wrong direction. So my senior year of high school, this massive scar over here is because I fell playing football and stuck my arm in it, catch myself, and it was like this, like pointing straight up in the air. So just imagine if I was like, hey, baby, I see your arm. That's clearly not the direction it's supposed to be pointing. But it's the Sabbath, so you're going to have to wait till tomorrow. <laughs> like, who would do that? Well, in this day, that would have been the practice. That this intense interpretation of the law would be, no, 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 no. Setting that arm back in place, bringing relief would be work. We ought not do that. And so what happens in this moment, there's a man with a withered hand, got an arm in great pain. And they look at, the Pharisees look at Jesus and say, is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath? What are you going to do, Jesus? This man is suffering. He's in great pain. He's in the synagogue, the place of worship. And they set him up. And Matthew lets us know it was so they might accuse him. So they didn't have compassion for the suffering man. They didn't actually want to know what the law said. They wanted to accuse Jesus of breaking the law. That was the goal. And Jesus now exposes their lack of love. Verse 11, he said to them, Which one of you who has a sheep, if it falls into a pit on the Sabbath, will not take hold of it and lift it out? Of how much more value is a man than a sheep? So it is lawful to do good on the Sabbath. Then he said to the man, stretch out your hand, which was impossible for the man to do at this moment until the Lord of creation speaks to your dead hand and makes it a new creation. And the man stretches out his hand and it's restored healthy like the other. So what does Christ do in this moment? He uses this illustration to demonstrate how self-love would motivate these Pharisees to get their sheep out of a pit. So it's like, oh, tell me, tell me, tell me. You love yourself enough to where if one of your animals who brought you some income was in a bad situation, out of compassion for the animal, maybe, maybe compassion for the income, but out of compassion for the animal, you would do whatever it takes to get your sheep out of the pit. You understand that it, the law is meant for a particular purpose. It's not meant to undo compassion and love for one who's suffering, even for a suffering animal. And in fact, what Christ is doing here, I think, is brilliant because he's, he's, he, he shows how the law commands care and concern for animals. But I want you to notice even it was animals, it could be animals belonging to an enemy or to your brother. Exodus 23, verse 4. If you meet your enemy's ox or his donkey going astray, you shall bring it back to him. 
If you see the donkey of one who hates you lying down under its burden, you shall refrain from leaving him with it. You shall rescue it with him. So you're, even your enemy, rescue his animal. Definitely also your brother, Deuteronomy chapter 22. You shall not see your brother's ox or his sheep going astray and ignore them. You shall take them back to your brother. If he does not live near you and you do not know who he is, you shall bring it home to your house and it shall stay with you until your brother seeks it. Then you shall restore it to him. And you shall do the same with his donkey or with his garment, with any lost thing of your brother's which he loses and you find you may not ignore it. You shall not see your brother's donkey or his ox falling down by the way and ignore them. You shall help him to lift them up again. So he's like, wait a minute. If the law says don't ignore your brother, meaning your brother in Israel, his ox or donkey, or even your enemy, you would not let your own animal suffer and die even on the Sabbath. And so he's saying, and human beings are more valuable than animals. Like, so you've got a compassion for animals that you don't even have for humans. Now, we live in a culture where actually what I'm saying right now is controversial, which is utter nonsense. Human beings are more valuable than animals, period. Jesus said it. He's Lord. Deal with him, not me. He said it. Animals are valuable. Human beings made in the very image of God are more valuable. They're the crown and glory of creation. So he's demonstrating, look, you would do something for an animal you're not even willing to do for a human being. He's exposing their selfishness and shows how doing good to a neighbor on the Sabbath is upholding the law, not breaking it. This man is more valuable than the sheep. And this, Christ has done this consistently. You remember in the Sermon on the Mount? He said, look at the birds of the air. They neither sow nor reap nor gather nor barns, yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not more value than they? And then just back in chapter 10, are not two sparrows sold for a penny? Not one of them falls to the ground apart from your father. Even the hairs of your head are all numbered. Fear not, therefore you are more value than many sparrows. So what is he doing when he puts all this together? He's showing these Pharisees love for God does not contradict love for people. Any interpretation of the law of God that leads you to love people less is a wrong interpretation of the law of God. You can't obey the first four of the Ten Commandments, which deal with right worship of God. You can't obey those four if you break five through ten, which deals with right relationship with human beings. The right use of the law is consistent with the splunk nizomai, our, our word. Christ looked on the crowds and he felt compassion, he felt pity in his heart. So the right interpretation of the law is consistent with the heart of God. The, the heart of God who says, I'm gentle and lowly in heart, come to me. So you cannot think you're actually upholding the law of God while not showing compassion to suffering sinners. That's utter nonsense. You don't even treat animals that way. This is what Christ is showing to these Pharisees. The right use of the law is consistent with the gentle and lowly heart of Christ. Mark lets us know in his account that Jesus looked around at the Pharisees with anger, grieved at their hardness of heart, and said to the man, stretch out your hand. He looks around like, I cannot believe you would say you represent me. And you got a hard heart towards a suffering sinner in your midst, even in the place of worship. And he heals the man. He, two lies then I want you to understand about God's law that could lead you to misunderstand God. Two lies about God's law that could lead you to misunderstand him. And Satan, the enemy of God, would be happy for you to believe either of these two lies. Number one, that the law of God is not good for you. Think about Genesis 3 in the garden when Satan tempts Adam and Eve. The law of the Lord is not, God's word is not good for you. He's holding out from you. He's, hi, he's hiding pleasure from you. And if he was a good God, he would let you get what you want. And so then the first lie is to assume that God doesn't know what's best for me when it comes to my sexuality. That God doesn't know what's best for me when it comes to my money. God doesn't know what's best for me when it comes to my life. God doesn't know what's best for me when it comes to my ethics and my morals. I know what's best for me. And if I don't get what I think is best for me, he must be holding out on me. The law is not good. This is like the number one trick of Satan. The first trick in the book, convince you God's word is not good. It's not trustworthy. It's not for your good. But the second lie about the law of God that misrepresents who he is is that the law is meant to prove that you're good. So first you might say the law is not good for me. It's holding back. It's preventing me from true life and pleasure. And so you, you think sin is better than God and, and you know better than him. The second lie is the law is the means by which I prove to God I'm good and I deserve the gifts I want. You can't earn God's approval. You can't obey his law and make him in debt to you to give you what you want. This is not how gospel works. Satan will be very happy if you believe either of those two lies. 
The law is not good for me, or the law is the means by which I prove to God that I'm good. You're not good. No, no one is good. This is what Paul says in Romans. If you think you're good, you'll never come to the one who says, come to me. I'm gentle and lowly of heart. I'm here for weak and weary and wounded sinners. And then Christians, please understand also that great passion for God's truth should lead to great compassion for people. Like, if you're a person who says, I'm passionate about the truth, and you're not compassionate, you're not actually compassionate about the truth. You think you are. So did the Pharisees. Pharisees are passionate about the truth and passionate about the Word of God and passionate about the law and making sure we obey God. And Jesus is exposing the lack of compassion means you don't, not only do you not love people, you don't even really love God. So please understand Jesus is good and he does good. He's the Lord of all. He demonstrates that by showing new creation to this hand. He demonstrates my law is consistent and upheld because I am good and compassionate and I do good even on the Sabbath. And that is upholding my good law, which itself is good. So what does that look like practically for you even on a a Sunday, the Lord's Day, as we gather? Don't show up on Sunday morning judging people based on how they minister to you and if they talk to you or not. Show up on Sunday morning asking yourself, am I ready to reach out to people and minister to them? I'm not here like a Pharisee to judge and see who's doing what's right and wrong. I'm here as one who's been received by my compassionate God to give forth compassion and mercy to those who are suffering. Leon Morris says it like this. It's the practice of compassion that should distinguish the people of God rather than the the punctilious observance of outward regulations, no matter how sacred. Compassion is much more important and much more characteristic of those who really are the servants of God. The compassionate do not rush to condemn people as the Pharisees had condemned people who were guiltless. If you're going to err, err on the side of compassion, doing good because of the truth, not to compromise the truth, but because the truth is the truth. So the Pharisees then expose the fact that they, again, they not only don't love this man, they don't love God. Look at verse 14. The Pharisees went out and conspired against him how to destroy him. See, when you don't really love people, you don't actually love God. They said they love God. They said they love truth. They were trying to keep the Sabbath day holy because they love God. Yet God is in their midst showing compassion to a sinner that they don't show compassion for. And Jesus reveals, now you're trying to kill God. Do you love God? No, you're trying to kill him. Because he doesn't line up with your views on the right uh, expression of his mercy and grace going forth. So again, Jesus is Lord. That's good news because he's good and does good. And very briefly to conclude and wrap up our time together, the climax of his goodness is almost beyond human comprehension. It's, I mean, literally in this moment, Jesus is victory for the weak and weary. The climax of his goodness and what he does is he is victory for the weak and the weary. Not the strong, not the impressive, not the religious, not those who put him in his debt because they do good, but the weak and weary who come to him, Jesus is their victory. Matthew now calls on his longest quote from the Old Testament to make sure we don't misunderstand Christ because of the misrepresentation from these Pharisees. They've loaded up all these demands. They got everyone walking around on eggshells because of the harshness that is, that is foreign to any servant of God, let alone the servant of God. This harshness, this burden, this pressure. Jesus is now, Matthew's going to show us how Jesus' authority is proven by his compassion and his mercy and his tenderness towards the outsider, the weak, weary sinner. He's Lord of the Sabbath and yet divine servant of justice, hope, and victory for all who come to him. Look at verse 15. Jesus, aware of this, withdrew from there, and many followed him, and he healed them all and ordered them not to make him known. So notice he's not after some cheap temporal fame. He's just compassionate. He just keeps healing people. Now he's like, shh, don't go tell everybody because it's not my time yet. My compassion is going to find its climactic expression in the cross when I suffer and die for sinners. It's not time for that. So I'm healing you because I'm compassionate. Don't go tell everybody. And then we see this quote from Isaiah 42. Jesus, the divine servant of justice, hope, and victory for suffering sinners. Matthew lets us know this was to fulfill Isaiah 42. Look at verse 18. Behold my servant whom I have chosen. My beloved one with whom my soul is well pleased. You should think of Jesus' bath, uh, baptism in Matthew three seventeen, And then we'll see in his transfiguration, Matthew 17, verse 5, the same phrase from God. This is my beloved one. This is my son with whom I'm well pleased. 
I will put my spirit upon him, and he will proclaim justice to the Gentiles. He will not quarrel or cry aloud, nor will anyone hear his voice in the streets. A bruised reed he will not break, a smoldering wick he will not quench until he brings justice to victory. And in his name, the Gentiles will hope. The book of Isaiah has four servant songs, four prophecies, 700 years before the life of Christ, about this coming servant. Now, Israel was anticipating this, this Messiah. This militant, victorious, powerful, geopolitical Messiah that would smash Rome and give power back to Israel. So they're thinking he's going to show up, he's going to flex, and we're going to get the good seats. But there, there, were, there were these promises in Isaiah. No, there's a servant coming. He's not what you would expect. The most famous one, Isaiah 53, that describes Christ suffering on the cross as our substitute in our place. But the first of these servant songs is Isaiah 42. And just notice a few things that we see. This quote that he shows us, instead of, of coming like this militant leader who's going to wreck shop and demonstrate and set up and show with power, we find out this servant, the father will be pleased with him. He's the anointed one, anointed with the spirit uniquely for a unique work. He is the Christ. But he comes to bring justice to the Gentiles, the sinners, the outsiders, the tax collectors, the dudes picking the grains in the field with Jesus that the Pharisees are so upset about. He comes to bring justice to those outside people, not the religious, not those who you would think. He, he comes to bring forth. He, he's not flexing power, screaming in the streets, banging his chest saying, look what we're doing. No. The bruised reed, so think a piece of wheat in a field that's been bruised and beat up in, his, in, in Jewish culture. Okay, just trample on it, throw it on the ground, burn it. It's of no use. He's not going to break the bruised reed. That wick of the candle, when it's kind of like it, 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 won't, it won't warm you up or light the room anymore, the wick is too little, it's, it's too messed up, he doesn't quench it and put it out. A bruised reed he will not break. A smoldering wick he will not put out. What's he saying? What's this prophecy promising? He's saying those who think, you know what? Like, I'm such a bad sinner. And I try to repent, but my repentance is so weak and I try to cling to Christ, but my clinging is just so weak. And I try to be disciplined and devout and read my Bible, but my discipline is just so weak. I'm the kind that impressive religious leaders just throw aside and say, you're worthless. Jesus says, that's the kind of people I came for. Those who understand themselves to be weak. Those who understand themselves to be a sinner. Those who understand themselves to have nothing in and of themselves to make them impressive to God. Jesus says, that's who I came for. And I will not quench them. I will not say, your passion and your flame is too low. I'm done with you. Instead, my mercy and my grace has come to me. I'll give you rest. And that's what sets the flame ablaze. I give new flames. I, I straighten up and fix bruise reeds. I don't crush them. I don't send them away. Those who've been crushed by false teachers... Those, again, who feel weak in repentance. Those who feel like moral train wrecks. Those who feel like spiritual bankrupts. Do you remember how he began the Sermon on the Mount? Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of God. The poor, the downcast, the downtrodden, the outsider, the castaway. Jesus won't throw you away. Quite the opposite. He'll bring justice. He'll bring hope. He'll bring victory. So what do we do with this and how do we wrap this up? Here's what I want you to understand. We've talked about, uh, two weeks ago about repentance. So Christ gives this invitation. Come to me. You're weary and heavy laden. I'll give you rest. You've got to acknowledge I'm sinful. I'm a rebel, and I have no hope to get right with God. Except God got right with me through the person and work of Christ. By Christ living for me the life I could not live, though I should have. Dying for me the death he did not deserve, but I deserve because of my sin. And raising on the third day because he's a Messiah. And he offers this reconciliation back to God because he's gentle and lowly in heart. And he invites all those who are weary and wounded from sin and sickness and burdens of your own causing and of your causing of others to come to him and he'll give you rest. And in the end, justice. In this life, some will be cast aside and thrown away, and justice, we won't see justice in this life. But in the end, you'll either bow the knee and say, Jesus is Lord. He is good, and he does good, and he gave me my victory. Hail, all hail, power to glory, and glory to Christ's name. Or you'll bow before him as the righteous judge. Justice will be served. No injustice will go unpunished. No one will win the victory by cheating. 
Christ is the only one who's won the victory, and he offers it freely to those who understand, I'm weak, I'm weary, I need a Savior. And so we end this morning right where we began. Jesus saying, don't let anyone misrepresent me. Come to me, all who are weary and heavy laden. I'll give you rest. Run to Christ by faith. Let's close in prayer. Father, we thank you for Jesus.